Hi everybody, I'm David Gregg. This week's video is another in our series looking at people and places of natural historical interest in Rhode Island. This time we're at the URI Herbarium. We'll be visiting with Professor Keith Killingbeck and he'll be telling us what an herbarium is and what's special about the URI Herbarium that you might be interested in. So let's see what he's got. The Rhode Island Natural History Survey presents videos to showcase the animals, plants, geology, and natural systems that surround us, and the people and organizations working to understand and conserve them. Well, hi. My name is Keith Killingbeck. I am a retired professor of biology at the University of Rhode Island. And even though I retired a number of years ago, I'm still doing research, and my office is here adjacent to the herbarium. So the first question to answer is, what is an herbarium? And as a former colleague of mine at Kansas State University, who is a brilliant guy and the curator of a wonderful herbarium at K-State, Ted Barkley's definition of an herbarium is a museum of dead plants. And that is, in a nutshell, what it is. So I have a question. Uh What's the difference between an herbarium and the greenhouse full of living plants that's over on the other side of campus? Well, all the plants here are dead, <laughs> for one. And um, the plants in the greenhouses here have, how should I say this? They, they are not, most of them are not very old. Many of the plants in this herbarium um, were alive in the 1800s. Oh, cool. And, and I'll talk about that a little bit. So, so that's not an herbarium. A greenhouse full of different plants is not an herbarium. Absolutely. Okay. They're not all dead. And maybe in a greenhouse at some <laughs> point they will be dead. But here we have an important research tool and a historical research tool that becomes actually more valuable every year. This is not the University of Rhode Island Herbarium. It is in fact in and at the University of Rhode Island, but officially it is the Curie Herbarium, capital K-I-R-I, -I, which stands for, you may have guessed it already, Kingston, Rhode Island, simple as that. So in the Index Herbariorum, which is the place that actually is hosted by the New York Botanical Garden now has the names, the official names of 3100-ish herbaria throughout the world. And we are the Curie Herbarium. So the question now becomes, well, how do you use an herbarium and what do we have here? So we have over 12,000 barcoded plants that are part of our higher plant collection. We also have a number of fungi collections. We have some algal collections that are being curated. We also have a great collection of lichens. In any herbarium, there will always be a, effectively a key to all plant families and where they're housed in the cabinets. So in fact, here we have a two page table of contents as it were of all the plant families that are housed here in the Curie Herbarium. So let's just take, uh, let's see. Um, if, let's say you were interested in invasive plants. Let's take a look at, let's take a look at Bear Baradaceae. And the number to the right of that family name on our list is five. And that means that it's in cabinet five. So we'll walk this way. And cabinet five. And we'll see where the Bear Baradaceae is. That is. So right down here. So if you can see this, the family names are written on these portals. And within each family, <clears throat> And for the Bear Baradaceae, it looks like there's only one family, which should be Bear Baris, which it is. 
So again, this is the Bear Bear Daisy folder. And the first specimen that I'm seeing here is Berberus vulgaris, collected in May 1940 by J. Dorsey <clears throat> Ooh, from a field in Germantown, Pennsylvania. Cool. You'll notice, boy, this brings up all kinds of topics. You'll notice that there's a, a zebra code, a barcode, on this. <clears throat> as there is with all 12,600 and some higher plants that we have in our cabinets. Every one of them has one of these, which is uh, specific to that specimen, not just the species, but to that specimen. So roughly uh, three, four years ago, uh, after making contact with Patrick Sweeney at Yale University, we decided that we would have our higher plant collection digitized. And by we decided, I mean, I mean that there was an NSF grant with money through Yale to be able to do that. Patrick was good enough to suggest that um, they could do that. And what happened was folks from Yale came, took our entire collection of higher plants, trucked them to Yale, photographed every one of every one of them after we had placed zebra stripes barcodes I should say on on every one of our plant specimens and actually we had uh, two students Megan Schaefer and Suzanne Enser uh, who were hired to do that after about eh, it wasn't it wasn't quite a year all of those specimens came back they came back after they were frozen at Yale, and that's another point that I want to make um, today. Uh, they were frozen to kill any insects or insect eggs that might have been in any of the specimens. And it turns out that one of the vagaries of having an herbarium is that you've got plants that are dry but still munchable by cigarette beetles and other types of insects. So it's really important to um, it smells yes. like mothballs in here. Maybe. Well, it used to smell like mothballs in here, David, um, because we used to use paradise chlorobenzene in all the cabinets to kill all the insects. It turns out that that's not the safest for those <laughs> of us who work in herbaria. Um, so many years ago, uh, we went to freezing all of our plants, and we have frozen every one of our higher plants that is uh, has been digitized um, at least three times and that really does a good job we still have to be aware of possible infestations but uh, we take take care of that by freezing again now so the other one of the other things that you'll notice on here is germantown pennsylvania 1940 and a little bit later today i'm going to show you what I believe to be the most famous specimen that we have in the herbarium, and I'll just leave it at that right now. The other thing you'll notice is the stamp up at the top, Rhode Island College Herbarium, number 1256. A number of years ago, actually quite a few years ago now, I got a call from Jerry Melorano, who was at Rhode Island College, and he said, Keith, our entire herbarium collection is going in the dumper unless it can be rescued. And we certainly didn't want that to happen. So Chris Narone and I at that time took our botany van, our old blue botany van, up to Rhode Island College, took the entire collection, brought them back here, which at that time the herbarium existed in Ranger Hall but Ranger Hall was repurposed, so it's now in Woodward Hall. And Peter Lockwood went through the entire collection and um, did a, a marvelous job. We introduced those, integrated those plants into 
the Curie Collection. So that's why you see Rhode Island College on that. Yeah. The, the other thing I want to mention is that within a genus sheet, you'll notice that there are multiple folders within a folder, and each of these folders is another species of Berberus. And <clears throat> normally, the sequence of folders within an individual genus folder is by the first letter, alphabetized by the specific epithet. So the second name in the scientific name is a specific epithet. And those, the first letter in those names is used to alphabetize all of the other um, folders, species folders within an individual genus. I never knew that there was more, there were more than one or two kinds of Berberus. I guess just not here. Yeah, yeah. So, great question, David. <laughs> so, we have plants not only from Rhode Island, but from many different locations. And, uh, in fact, a lot of that information is on the Consortium of Northeastern Herbaria, which is where all the data went, or goes, um, from all of the digitization that Yale did. All of that information is available on the web to you. And I'll, I'll show you how to get to that um, in a little bit. But we have plants that were collected in many different places, Arizona, North Dakota, Georgia, um, other countries. All those are incorporated into this set of plants. So we may have one or two Berberus species in Rhode Island, but there's there's more than that. So um, that's that. Cool. So so wait a minute. I have a follow up question. <clears throat> yeah. So did so we did URI ever send out an expedition to collect plants in all far some far so, corner of the world? Oh, so what? Probably no. <laughs> However, we've had faculty and and I did this too. I would collect plants when I was either doing research, for example, in the Chihuahuan Desert or other places, and some of those plants would be incorporated into our collections here. So we'll take a look at part of the lichen collection in the Rhode Island Natural History Survey Cabinet, no less. And lichens, uh, go back to the Berberus and how that was preserved in the kinds of folders that were used, lichens are totally different. So I'm gonna take out one sample and you'll notice that it is curated in a small envelope rather than in a large folder, simply because the size of these specimens and the fact that it's very difficult to, to press them so that they're very, very flat and all the information, the same kind of information that you have on the higher plants is on the lichen collection also. And again, Chris Rathel is working on that. These are all barcoded. You'll notice, I hope you can see, um, Curie, so Kingston, Rhode Island, that's our herbarium, with an individual number on it. So all the lichens are gonna be uh, coded the same way that our higher plants are. So what's it? What are, so is are those books a different way of storing lichens? The books are old ways. Of, in fact, I, I mean, I love these old binders. In fact, some of these are not even lichens. Yeah, but for example, the same kinds of folders, envelopes, if you will, that you saw here are just much older. And I, and I should point out... It's just tipped so, into the pages of, of, of that binder. Yeah, exactly. And some of these old, old binders contain just amazing specimens. And, and that is certainly the case with um, the higher plants, too. So, for example, a number of years ago, I got a note from a person at Rollins College in Winter Park, Florida, indicating to me that she had, actually was written to Roger Goose, Roger passed it on to me, 
and said that she had a, a, an old binder. It turned out to have shoestrings on it to, to close it, secure it. And it was in their archival department. They had, they noticed that many of the plants were from Rhode Island. They didn't know what to do with it. It wasn't serving them well. And she asked if, if we wanted it. I said, well, absolutely. We got it. It came again with these shoestrings to tie this old piece of uh, notebook together. And there were uh, 100 or more species, all labeled with local information. They were almost all locally collected. And there were some fabulous plant orchids that we hadn't seen in certain spots for many, many, many years. So those kinds of things, so in addition to, for example, Rhode Island College collection that we have, we've got a collection that was for some reason given to um, Rollins College. So this is a specimen that I mentioned earlier, I think, at least to me, it's our prize specimen, at least in, in some ways. And if you take a look at the label, which is script written, as most old labels were, it was collected in 1863 on the Gettysburg Battleground. So the Battle of Gettysburg was the, had the highest mortality of any battle in the Civil War. And that battle occurred from the 1st to the 3rd of July. So, a couple months later, somebody is on the battlefield collecting a specimen of sorghum. And it was, uh, again, in the Rhode Island College Collection. And it was originally collected, so that's where the collection was, but it was also at Temple University. And, and this happens as Herbaria closed. So we go from Temple to Rhode Island College Herbarium, and before that, collected by the Herbarium of Germantown Botanical Club, which was a, a thriving club in Philadelphia in the 1800s. And how Rhode Island College ever ended up with this, we, we don't know the story because the person who was curating the Herbarium at Rhode Island College died a number of years ago, so we don't know the whole story. Look at how well that's preserved. Is, sor and, is sorghum a crop? Is that the crop sorghum or is that a native sorghum? It's uh, none of the sorghums that we have in the United States are native. They're all either African or Asian. And uh, so it is a crop. It's a crop. Yeah. So um, amazing. And perfect situation, a perfect specimen kept very well over these years and Still amazing to me that anybody would be out on the Battle of Gettysburg during the Civil War after this massive battle, and who knows what else was on the battlefield when uh, this collection was made or why it was why it was made. So I had to show that to you. So I'm just going to the Orchidaceae family, and I'm going to pull out just at random the top. Genus. And here we have Cypripedia macaulay, collected in 1969, Pine Hill Road, North Situate, Rhode Island. And even though that was collected more than 50 years ago, it's in absolutely perfect shape. All these plants have been pressed um, in, you know, pressed to actually dry them out as quickly as possible. They always lose some color, but drying them quickly preserves some of that color. And as long as they're dry, they're not as susceptible to mold. That's, in addition to insects, that's the other killer of plants in an herbarium, and that is humidity. And uh, you can see, even though this is so old, bingo, it looks perfect. The other thing I'm just noticing here 
is take a look at specimen poison, mercuric chloride. Uh, mercuric chloride was used in some herbaria long ago, it was never used at URI, never used in the Curie herbarium that I know of. Uh, Paradise chlorobenzene isn't a whole lot better, but mercuric chloride was worse. And we actually had the safety office here come and measure the levels of mercury in the cabinets and in the air here. And we found that, that it had been diminished so much that it was not an issue anymore. But I can imagine at one time at Rhode Island College, it, it, it was an issue. But we certainly don't use that anymore. So let's see what we have here as So this has minimum information, but it was this specimen again in perfect shape was collected in June 1884. Wow. Yeah. That is cool. And some of these, if they're collected in Rhode Island, they're they maybe don't exist here anymore. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, there are some plants that we have here that are <laughs> state records really because they haven't been found for for many years uh, another plant 1925 another one of the rhode island college collection 1925 so are those little tiny strips of paper gluing it down yes yeah great question david there are differences of opinion among herbarists <laughs> about how to mount plants. And this is not my favorite. So using little strips of tape to mount them is certainly a, a legitimate way of attaching them to mounting sheets. The other way that I prefer is um, using non-toxic, non-yellowing, uh, pH neutral glues. And to me... Um, and you just glue it directly down to the paper. You just glue it directly down to the paper. Um, the other thing is, there's a whole set of techniques about mounting specimens that one wants to be careful about when doing so. And certainly, for example, if, and I don't have, a, so for example, if we had, um, if we had red oak and we had a sample of red oak that we wanted to put on an herbarium sheet, we'd want to make sure that we had at least one leaf bottom up, one leaf top up, so that you could look for hairs, you could venation patterns much more easily, and so on. So there's a way of displaying a plant, not only for the, the visual aspect or the aesthetics of it, but also for the scientific part of it and being able to look for features that you don't want to once a plant is on a sheet, you don't want to be pulling it up and turning it around and you, you just, that would be uh, not only not good technique, but you just wouldn't. You'd wreck it. Want, you'd, you'd wreck it, thank you, <laughs> scientifically put. Do herbaria collect the parts of plants that aren't flat, like cones and seeds and tree ring sections and bark and all that stuff? Yes. <laughs> the short answer is yes. So David just asked about other kinds of organisms and we have lots of seaweeds. We've had phycologists on the staff um, for a long time and they and their students have made some significant collections. So here we have a folder of ulva and Which is in the news quite a bit now because it's one of the things that has blooms that <laughs> cause ecological problems. Yeah, absolutely. And this was, uh, this is Entromorpha. I don't know why it was. No. These are in the midst of being curated. Not, not by me, but by the phycologist. So here's an Entromorpha uh, saltwater storage tank. Marshall Islands Pacific, 
1974 W.E. Gardner Collector. Collector, excuse me. And so we have multiple cabinets of um, generally called seaweeds, and which are algae. Which are algae. Yeah, I hate that. You know, I shouldn't call them seaweeds. I don't like that term, and I. Marine macroalgae. There, there you go. That's much better, David. I love it. <laughs> so I mentioned before that the uh, folks at Yale were good enough with a National Science Foundation grant to digitize our entire higher plant collection. <clears throat> and that is now available to, to anyone on the Consortium of Northeastern Herbaria. And I have the opening page I'll put the get the portal page up on that on the site very easy to get to the web address is www.neherbaria.org and it's been so long since I initially registered that I don't even remember how I did that anymore right now as soon as I beam this up I'm in without any passwords or anything else. I think you do have to register the first time, but it's easy and it's free. It doesn't, doesn't cost anything. So let's say that we're interested in what we have at the at, uh, URI in the Curie collection. And let me go to collections and you'll see all the entire list of all the herbaria in the Northeast that have had their all their specimens uh, digitized. Not all or very in the Northeast have had that yet. Most have, but not all. So let's go down. To University of Rhode Island. We're just going to click on that. Founded the, the herbarium. 1892. So it's been around for a while. And you'll notice that there are 12,682 specimen records that are in this digital collection. There are uh, over 12,000 images, 210 families, over 1,100 genera, over 3,800 species that we have. Down at the bottom, you can see two hot, hot phrases, show geographic distribution, show family distribution. Let's hit family distribution. And these are all the families that we have in the collection, along with the number of specimens in each family. So let's uh, well, let's go down to Bear Baradaceae again. We have 64 specimens in that family. Bear Burris has 37. If you so, when when you look at these genera, the the part of that listing that's hot is the number. So, if you were just to hold the cursor over Bear Burris, it does nothing. Just put it over the 37. Click it. And, and here they are. So these are the 37 specimens of Berberus that we have in the collection. And let's see, let's, oh, here we go. So thinking that Berberus is an invasive species and maybe it was invasive pretty recently. Well, take a look at this. We've got a specimen collected by of all people, George Burlingame. And it was collected in 1892. Beamed it up, there it is. You can open it in a medium format, large format. Let's just open the whole thing up. Oops. That's cool. And there it is, June 1892, 
College Grounds, Barberry, Berbers, Bulgaris. Huh. So, yeah, not, not exactly recent. Uh, now, if you're only interested in a certain herbarium, let, let's say Kiri, what you want to do is you're going to go up to the top here, and there's a check mark in Select, Deselect. And you're going to click that, and that has deselected all of the herbaria. So what you want to do is go down to University of Rhode Island, Curie, click on that box, and that limits your search to Curie. So you're going to hit the search, you're going to type in whatever you want, Ace of Ruber again. And hit list display. And here we've got 20 second, 27 records, 27 specimens, if you will, of Acer Rubrum. And you can access every one of them. Let's just pick one at random about uh, whatever this is. And we'll make that large again. Cool. Isn't that, yeah, isn't that nice? But there's so much information at your fingertips, it's, it's just amazing. The question becomes, well, do you need the herbarium anymore? And, and we've heard that here, but there are so many other aspects of the herbarium, plus having a physical sample of a plant or an animal or whatever we're looking at is so, so important. You can't take DNA samples off an image. Just, just as an example, there was a, a, an interesting article in, I think it was the most recent American Journal of Botany, about the value of small herbaria. And they looked at herbariums, uh, herbaria around the world, and the number of specimens that were unique to small herbaria was, was kind of startling. So it's not as though the large herbaria are the be all and end all. And so certainly small herbaria, it, even though we have almost 13,000 plants barcoded, um, it's still considered to be a, a small herbarium. Natural History Survey videos are made possible through the generous contributions of members and friends. Want to help us do more environmental science and conservation? Hit the like button, share our videos with your circle, subscribe, or make a financial contribution on our website, ranhs.org, or through Patreon. Thanks, and see you out there.